All right. And as we go through all of the slides today, um, just letting you know that we will provide a copy uh, for you to be able to um, review on your own. We'll also be providing you with a number of materials that will be helpful to you as you're doing the scoring. And so some of the things that we might include would be um, a link to the RFP webinar that we did, which has a lot more background and information about the program itself that we didn't include in this particular review training because so many of you are familiar with the program and we were trying to balance between those of you that have a lot of knowledge about the program versus those that might be new and making sure that you're not here all day. And so um, that way we can share that other information with you so you can get more in-depth information about the program as well. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, Minnesota Housing um, is the foundation for success. And so we collaborate with individuals, communities, and partners to create, preserve, and finance housing that is affordable. And we'll do really quick introductions. Um, I think the easiest way to do this because of timing would be to put your information into the chat. Um, and then you can add um, your name, pronouns, and um, how you're connected uh, to this FHPAP review process. Maybe you're coming from another state program or you're coming from the community to help us review. I, I'm Diane Elias and I work at Minnesota Housing. My pronouns are she, her, and I manage the Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program as well as working with the Homework Starts with Home Program. And I will uh, turn it over to Nancy to introduce herself as well. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for <clears throat> volunteering your precious time to review um, our FHPAP applications. My name is Nancy <clears throat> Urbanski, excuse me, and my pronouns are she, hers, and I work alongside Diane in the in this program, the FHPAP program, as well as Homework Starts with Home. All right, and so for our uh, agenda today, we'll probably go through um, some of the scoring information and then talk about how that works with the application. And we'll also give you information about sort of your role and what that means. And then we'll look at the um, timeline and how we go through that review process as well. And we'll have some time for questions at the very end. So, first of all, um, just noting that you will all receive. Uh, two forms that that you'll have to sign and one is the conflict of interest form which is incredibly long I don't want to say it's 20 pages but it's close to 20 pages and so um, if, if you go through that process of going through you'll kind of want to read as you're going along and then there's I think um just one place for a signature, but you do have to check a box to say whether or not there's a conflict. And so you'll get that list of all of the applicants along with um, getting a DocuSign document to sign the conflict of interest. And then there's also a non-disclosure agreement, and that's only a page long, which basically says you won't be providing information about um, the review process and, you know, some of the recommendations for selection um, ahead of when we're able to contract with those those organizations. So the hardest part about this process is that it just takes so long for us to be able to release the information publicly. State agencies are not supposed to release uh, who the awarded entities are until they're all under contract with our organization. Um, the the one sort of exception related to state agencies is that Minnesota Housing has a separate board. And because of that, at our board meeting, um, those documents are made public on our website. And so often our administrators who have applied um, for funding or you know applicants that have applied for funding will look at our website to see what the recommendations are. And so they might know well in advance of the contract what's being recommended. Um, but we would like, you know, as much as possible for you to just keep that knowledge um, 
close to you and not shared until we have the ability to be under contract. And the contract execution date will likely be around October 1st. Um, if for some reason there's a contract that doesn't execute by October 1st, we'll still have to wait before we publish that, that documentation. But you will have a really good sense at the end of this process um, and the review meeting that we have together about who is likely to be funded. All right. Diane, if I may add one thing. Yes. Um, I know our friends at OEO know this. This is a fairly new conflict of interest policy. And as such, um, I've noticed that it takes a little bit longer on our end if a reviewer um, indicates that there's, there may be a potential or a perceived or real conflict of interest. And like, for example, Annie, I'll use you as an example. You um, indicated there's a conflict of interest with the Metro Agency. And so we are assigning you greater Minnesota applications, but I'm anticipating if you'll as if you'll indicate that on that form there's going to be a lag before we can send you those applications and that's because that that's under review so we apologize in advance for a lag and i'll do my very best to get those applications out to you as soon as possible and we'll communicate with you any de delay that's occurring thanks nancy uh so let's get into the scoring and application information um, you will all receive the applications that you're going to review, and there'll be basically two documents that you'll receive. One is the application and one is the budget. And then in addition to that, that'll be the application, sort of the application documents. And then in addition to that, you'll receive a scoring worksheet. And next slide. So we have some tips. Um, it really does help to have a place to score them and maybe even some carved out work time where you're not getting interrupted. Uh, that way you can concentrate on reading through those. Uh, we recommend taking over maybe your dining room table or a place where you can spread out some of the information. And then we also have some other tips. Um, you can sometimes, it's easier to quickly read through the application and just get a sense for what each one is is um, requesting and then um, you might decide that you want to read um, section by section so you might have three applications and you'll compare them with each other kind of by reading section by section that helps you get a sense at least initially of what the scoring might look like for uh, an application in general because sometimes if you read one and you haven't started to read the others then it might be really hard to figure out like what is the scoring looking like for this and how should it look? Um, and next slide. So opportunities to score one at a time or read section by section and compare or read them all and then maybe score them that way. Um, and and it, you'll come up with your own methodology as you go through the process. So you can try different things to see what works best for you. Um, but just letting you know that that's some of the strategies that we've seen from other review processes. So the score sheet looks like this. Um, it'll have the section of the application as the title at the top. And then on the left hand column, it'll have the application question and in the middle you'll see the scoring criteria um, that goes along with that question. And at the very bottom of the scoring guide section, you'll see some hints about what would it take for someone to reach like a top score in this particular area. So in addition to um, the criteria that says, you know, applicant identified data sources and provided an analysis that clearly describes a significant need, we give you some hints at the bottom about what might lead you to scoring that particular question highly. And then you'll see the possible points um, to the right of that and a place to actually put the score in the next column. And then there's also a place for comments. And one thing that we encourage is positive and constructive comments. Um, if, for example, you read it and you really are questioning what the narrative um, meaning is and you you just haven't really found the clarity there if you could say 
I would have liked to see more clarity on and then name something that you would want to see more clarity on rather than just saying something like lacked clarity. Um, because what happens is at the end of our application process, for those um, who've both received awards and who have um, received a letter saying that they haven't been selected, they're given the opportunity to meet with us and go over their scoring. And so Nancy and I will compile all of the scores and comments into um, kind of a spreadsheet that we share with that applicant. We're very transparent. So whatever you write in there will get shared. I mean, obviously, we don't typically share the name of who scored the application, um, but we do share like the comments and information. And on that note, I just want to say that should someone ask us for the names of who scored the application or specific score sheets, we would have to um, share those, but we typically don't get that that specific of a request. All right, next slide. So the application itself is um, broken into five sections that will total 100 points. Um, the, the first four sections, program design, equity, capacity, and budget, are worth 65 points, and that's what you'll be scoring. There's also a new applicant section, and you will not be scoring that. That's something that Nancy and I will be scoring. It's um, comparable to what we're scoring for existing administrators on their performance. And so we've already done the performance scoring for existing administrators, um, and they wouldn't be filling out that 35 point section because they're an existing administrator, not a new applicant. But then we'll take the new applicant sections and we'll also be scoring those um, just so that we have some consistency between those two performance scores. And then you'll be scoring the, the sections um, program design, equity, capacity, and budget. And as you can see, um, the, the section with the greatest number of points is equity. And so you'll that's really, you know, kind of where you'll spend the bulk of your time determining um, whether this application is sort of reaching the quality that we would like to see as well. Next slide. Um, so as mentioned, uh, it will have a, a score of 65 possible. We do expect that applications kind of fall on a bell curve, and that's really kind of hard um, for, you know, a lot of our, our reviewers because most people tend to score higher rather than in the middle. But to the extent possible, what we, we'd like to see is scores that are a little bit more across the board so that we can delineate out which applications are really meeting that high scoring criteria versus some that are in the middle versus some that might be lower scoring. And next slide. Um, we do have a regional split of funding currently, and so how we um, how we end up scoring applications is we divide between the metro and greater Minnesota, the funding that's available. And then in a sense, the metro pool is sort of competing with each other and the greater Minnesota pool is competing with each other. Um, it doesn't really look like that initially because initially we're scoring everything and then we'll see who the top scoring applications are and then who the lower scoring applications are, um, but that's that's where we start. And then then we really have kind of a split between metro area and greater Minnesota. And those that are higher scoring in those regions will be the ones that will be most likely to receive additional funding if they're an existing administrator or higher funding if they're a new applicant. Um, then another thing that's taken into consideration when we do the funding award is we look at the share of need that that particular um, application represents. So we have information that is uh, for each county and tribe, and we look at whether or not um, the amount of funding that's being requested or that they've received in the past and is now going to be requested uh, matches the need in their region. And so in some cases in the past, some administrators might be really high scoring, 
but they're well above their need. They've scored so well over the years that um, their funding is exceeding the need in their area. And when that's happened, um, they would be maybe less likely to receive an increase. And then um, similarly, uh, a low scoring application, but they're below their, their need and they, they don't have as much funding that would match what we're seeing in the formula, it's possible that they um, they might not get um, additional funding, but it also might hold them from losing funding. And so where we see the greatest gain um, for for the applications is when someone's higher scoring, but yet they don't have enough money to meet the need that we've seen in the data. And they are the ones that are most likely to gain funding. And then on the other end, um, the lower scoring regions who already have more than their share often are the ones that would lose funding in order to move that to the higher scoring application. Now this time around, it all looks different potentially because we may have a lot more funding available. And so most likely we won't see a lot of applicants that will be um, experiencing a funding loss if we do receive the funds that are anticipated through the legislative process. So in that circumstance, whatever loss um, exists might be mitigated by that. And of course, we still don't know if all grant administrators who are prior grant administrators would receive funding. We don't know if there'll be new applicants joining and receiving funding. So that all plays into that as well. But just based on the governor budget and the amounts available, it's unlikely that um, someone who receives an award this time around would um, be losing any funding. All right. Um, the other thing that we just really want to um, emphasize is that uh, for the applications that you're reviewing, um, we want you to be balancing between applications, thinking about like, where is this application coming from? What are the resources available to this applicant compared to maybe another applicant? And trying to do that balancing act of providing a score to the application that is in the context of that particular applicant and how they're applying. Because in some cases, um, we have organizations that apply that have really sophisticated grant writing mechanisms. They might have a, and the ability to have a grant writer on staff and someone who can, um, you know, knows the system and maybe has also applied and received funding from FHPAP many times over the past several years. And so in some way that can put an applicant at an advantage with regard to the way that they write the application. Um, so we just want to make sure that you're thinking about um, giving opportunity for applications that maybe don't have the um, typical writing style for grants that come to the state, but yet they really have a great project and um, they have the capacity to be able to carry that out. So just trying to figure out like how you balance that. Great. So now for our review process and timeline, um, we have already received the applications and we have gone through a process where we look at what's called threshold criteria, making sure that they even meet the, um, the threshold of being able to be reviewed. So we've made sure that all the application materials are there, that everything's signed, that it's sort of feasibly eligible for the funds themselves. Um, we make sure that the application is submitted by the deadline. And so this way, if there have been any application issues, like maybe someone um, submitted something that's just slightly incorrect between the budget and the narrative, or they submitted a document, but they forgot to sign it, like any of the, the issues that we might have needed to address in that regard, we've addressed and we'll let you know about those if there's something you need to pay attention to when we send the application. And just as an example, in a prior application round, not necessarily this one, but we had an application where it was submitted 
um, and it exceeded a page limit that we had at the time. And so we had to give special instructions for that application on where to cut off your reading <laughs> so that you couldn't read beyond a certain point and count that information as part of your score. Fortunately, we have no page limit uh, criteria this time, and so um, that won't be an issue, but we'll just let you know if there are any specific issues related to that. All right, so our review meeting will take place um, on Tuesday, April 25th, and Metro applicants will be reviewed in the morning from 9 until noon, and then Greater Minnesota applicants from 1230 until, is that four, Nancy, on this one? Four I apologize. It did get changed to 430 because we have, we received a couple more applications than anticipated. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I know I was thinking that too. I'm like, I think it's one one extra half hour. Um, so we'll, we'll be meeting until 430 with the Greater Minnesota applications. And then just if you're able to submit your scores, um, your, basically your score sheet, which is an Excel document, to Nancy no later than noon on Monday, April 24th, that would be great. Um, we'll be able to then have some idea of what the application scores are looking like. It is not your last chance to be able to revise your score. Um, if we go to the review meeting and you weren't quite sure about um, maybe a section you were scoring on an application and then after the discussion, it really clarifies it for you and, and you want to change that score, you can still resubmit your score sheet to us after that review meeting. So we we just like to see um, that we get most of the score sheets ahead of the meeting if we can, but we totally understand that as a result of the meeting itself and the discussion, your score may change and then you'll still be able to uh, submit that to us. Hey, the Andy, other thing I have is that something. We, oh, oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. And okay. and I apologize that there's a there's another error on this slide. I'm actually asking for the applications to be submitted the following Friday by 4:30 p.m. Oh. And um, so we're get, we have two full weekends. Not that we're advocating working weekends. Um. So and because this this RFP it takes quite a bit of time to get all the scores entered in preparation for the meeting on Tuesday. However, if you need an extension, you know, you need time that weekend or what have you, just reach out to me. That is not an issue at all to give you additional time. So Nancy, are you thinking the 21st then, right? The 21st, of, yes. Okay. Yep, and that'll all be right. clarified in the email that I send you with your materials. That sounds great. Yeah, when we, it, it's hard to know sometimes how many applications are going to come in until it happens. And so sometimes we have more flexibility and can, can allow for more time and other times we're just not able to do that. So we appreciate you being able to get on the 21st and we'll, we'll revise that, that slide so that you have that information correct. Um, and then the regular timeline is just that um, we'll meet again. You can kind of see what happens here where you know we have the applications, we'll do that review meeting, and then we'll have a board meeting in June where we make recommendations. And at that time, that's when just shortly after that, our applicants will be notified about whether they're going to receive an award or not. And then um, we'll go through a process where we collect contract information starting in um, end of June and then all the way through the end of September. It gives a lot of time because there are some unique things about um, this particular grant where they do have to get um, sometimes county board resolutions uh, for the, the counties that they're serving when it's in greater Minnesota, so that can take some time. And then, of course, we'll have contracts executed um, hopefully by the 1st of October. Uh, we do we do expect um, that there will be some really interesting conversations this time around. Uh, just to give you a little bit of information, we had about $70 million in requests. Um, our program typically has $20 million available, $20.5 million available. However, this is a really unique biennium because we may have some additional funding available through the legislature. Um, the proposal by the governor was 100 million of one-time funds that would be for the biennium. 50 million of that has already been advanced to us to be able to issue out. And then there's an anticipated um, 50 million in addition that would come up before October. 
And so we, you know, we don't know for sure about that yet, but it does give us um, some additional funding possibilities. And so they did request 70 million. To, was it 70 million to or maybe no, it's even more. It's 80 some million, isn't it? Yeah, it's 80 some million, I think. So it's a lot of money that has been requested. Um, one other thing I should mention about the score sheet, you'll you'll so you'll get each application and budget. So if you're reviewing three applications, for example, you'll get three applications and the three budgets that go along with those applications, but you'll only get one score sheet, which is an Excel document. So then you'll have to open that and save it, you know, at several times if you're scoring more than one application. Um, and then you just can keep those and, and forward those uh, titled. The easiest way to title the score sheet is just to put the applicant name um, and then your initials. And that really helps us be able to um, put them back into our system and folders. All right, so any questions? We've told you all about scoring and very little about the program. That was sort of intentional. Um, obviously, this program provides a lot of assistance for households who are experiencing a housing crisis. It's relatively flexible, but it does have to do with housing. So most of the assistance is rent, deposit, utilities, mortgage, um, anything that that can help the household stabilize in housing. And then 